helps to turn on the mic. Howdy, folks. It is 7 o'clock on a fine Wednesday here at the beginning of November. Um, my name is Nick McPhee. This is the Unhindered by Coding live stream, um, episode 47. Amazing how many of these there have been um, starting in late May. Um, and thank you to those of you who are joining me. Um, so, today the goal is to return to the evolutionary computation project. Sorry, trading drinks. Should have done that before I started, but life is a challenge. Um, so, we last Wednesday, when we were working on the evolutionary computation project, we got the closure, sorry, uh, the Lexa case results sort of in a happy place. Um, we ended up with a total of four, maybe five, depending on how you want to count, implementations of Lexa case, did a bunch of um, uh, benchmarking. That was all done kind of in a hurry. Um, and in the end, uh, I'm not sure it meant a lot, at least not to me in the moment, um, but I went and sort of looked at it more carefully afterwards, and I'll share some of those summary results with you. Um, uh, then the real goal today is going to be to try to get the closure version of this working at a similar level of functionality so that I can do benchmarking between the Rust and the closure versions on a full um, GA system um, and see what those times look like. Uh, so far, all the times look like uh, something like an order of 100 at least uh, faster for Rust, but I still don't have a full a GA system implemented in closure to compare against. And it probably worth saying for those who are new, um, closure is what I've been doing. So my research area is evolution and computation. Um, closure is the language I and my research colleagues have been using for a decade or more. Um, and uh, I suspect that our runs take a whole lot longer than they might um, because I think closure is not all that fast in terms of runtime. Um, and so I'm curious to see if we can build something in similar in Rust, what the performance difference is, and is it enough to justify or convince people to switch or consider switching. Um, and I think that's not obvious. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that really like closure and Lisp-like languages. And I feel like they're going to find a lot of aspects about Rust kind of annoying. But if I can offer them a hundred times speed up in um, the cost of doing the runs, uh, I might be able to change their mind. Uh, we shall see. Uh, but I had the data first. And so this is really an exercise in collecting that data. Um, so that's the main thing we'll work on today. Um, if you've got questions about evolutionary computation, about Rust, about closure, because a lot of the code today is going to be closure code, definitely ask. And I would be happy to try to answer uh, and clarify things as we move on. So um, let me start by going over the benchmarking run, the benchmark results after last week's work. So we ended up with four versions of Lexa case selection. And if you're not familiar with evolution computation, it's not a real big deal with, about the details here, but Lexcase selection is a way of selecting an individual out of the population to be a parent. Um, it is uh, almost universally the, the selection mechanism that people in my little group 
I shouldn't say my group because it makes it sound like I lead the group, but the group that I'm part of um, almost entirely use lexicase selection and it's becoming much more widespread um, outside of our little group as well. Um, very, very useful from an evolutionary standpoint, point, has a lot of nice properties, is kind of computationally a pain in the butt uh, and adding it to the Rust code made the Rust code go a whole lot slower. So it was like, okay, this matters. Let's spend a little time thinking about how to optimize this. And so we implemented four different versions of Lexicase selection, um, uh, which are these four violin plots. This one here, the slowest one, um, is the sort of standard version um, which does some duplicate elimination, which I think is very expensive, but doesn't actually buy you very much. And I'm trying to make a case in the group I'm part of that we should stop doing that because I don't think that's helping. Um, it's certainly making it slower, and I don't think it's improving the world. Um, this is the same thing, but just with that duplicate removal taken out. And so it gets sub substantially shorter. The x-axis here is the average time. It's in fact the average time of doing an entire run. So when we were doing benchmarking last week, we were just looking at the cost of um, doing uh, a single selection. Um, and I was concerned that that might not be indicative of the more general um, performance issues, in particular since memory management is, my, I suspect, is a significant part of this. So uh, I actually did a benchmark where it actually runs a real, the real evolutionary system for 50 generations, a thousand individuals, bit strings of length 128, and this is the average time of those runs and there are two graphs, one for a problem called count ones and another for a problem called HIF. The general shape of the graphs are almost identical. They differ in uh, where they sit on the x-axis. So here, this is 10 seconds for a run um, for this middly guy. And here, this is a little, maybe five and a half seconds a run. So count ones is faster than HIF. This is not entirely surprising to me, somebody who knows the two problems. Um, uh, but as I was saying, this is the kind of standard Lexa case. This is the Lexa case with the duplicate removal taken out, and that speeds things up. Then we did a single pass version that was based on the implementation uh, in a system called Ellen by a colleague named Bill LaCava. Ellen's written in C, C++. Um, and uh, Bill did some things there that I was like, oh, you know, that would probably be faster. Let's try that. And indeed, that did improve the performance a little bit. And then um, with the help of Izitsu, which had some, uh, who had some very useful suggestions, we did another version where we reused memory kind of as much as we could. Um, and that also sped things up. So we went from sort of four and a half seconds for a full run um, versus we were at yeah, 12 and a half seconds. So this is sort of about a three times speed up from this slow one and even a close to a two times speed up. Um, well, no, not quite maybe a third, um, sort of this is probably two thirds of that. Um, uh, which is the sort of the simple one with only the one thing removed. So this is, you know, pretty much out of the box. And like I said, we got similar performance here, zippity doo -dah. Um So reusing the vector definitely wins, not necessarily by a ton. The big advantage is this sort of getting rid of the duplicate removal. That's the thing that makes the big difference. Okay, so that sort of catches up on where we left off 
last week and a little work I did after last week's stream and before today. And the goal tonight is to get the closure code. So I think the, the Rust code is, we've got a pretty reasonable implementation of a genetic algorithm in Rust. Um, it's not as flexible or user-friendly as I would like, but the goal here really is to get the timing for starters. So I don't want to spend too much longer on trying to niceify the Rust um, yet. We will do more of that later, probably, assuming the timing continues to be impressive um, and therefore justify continuing to work on the project. But assuming that's true, I think we'll um, uh, niceify the Rust code some more later. But I want to get the closure code in a state where we can do some head-to-head -head comparisons on full runs. So basically where this does full runs with Rust, I want to be able to do the same thing in Clojure and compare the two, because uh, I think that's really what's going to be important. Um, and just to give you a sense of what the timings are like, um, if we hop over here, so this, um, oh, that's Rust. This is Clojure. So this is closure, and because I don't have the closure code for a full run done yet, I was just looking at how long it took to construct a population of a thousand individuals. So what does it take to generate a thousand bit strings of length 128, actually, sorry, a hundred bit strings of length 128, evaluate them all and have that data structure ready to go. Um, and that took about 2.3 milliseconds. Um, this is using the criterion, uh, crit I never remember. Criterion or criterium. One of them is the Rust library. One of them is the closure library. They're both doing more or less the same thing, but in their respective languages. And I never keep I can never keep track of which name is which, um, uh, but uh, this basically runs the code to uh, create a population many many times and does stats on it. And it says, "Hey, the mean time to create up a hundred individuals and evaluate them is two point four milliseconds." Um, over here on the Rust side. Um, uh, We've got similar benchmarks. Oh, and this was, this is with, um, I think this is with HIF. Let me make sure. Um, closure. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing the HIF problem. Um, and so um, the Rust actually does both the HIF and the count ones. The HIF is 8.78 microseconds, which is definitely faster than two milliseconds. But this is actually a population size of a thousand versus a population size of a hundred. And if one assumes rather reasonably that this is going to scale roughly with the size of the population, um, this is this would really be like maybe 90 microseconds um, versus two milliseconds. So we are looking at not quite a hundred times, but probably um, 20 to 50 times faster for Rust to just to construct the population. Um, so. Rust is still looking a whole lot faster. Um, I mean, you know, even if we could get, well, I'm not sure I could convince anybody with a factor of two or four. I mean, I should be able to in a perfect world, but I'm not convinced that would actually happen. Um, but if I can, you know, if we're in the mat, you know, dozens of, of times faster, um, then it becomes pretty hard to look the other way. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, 
Uh, I'm probably not going to do the actual benchmarking here in the stream. Uh, the closure benchmarking tool is really quite slow. Um, uh, like I think this took several minutes to generate all this data. Um, whereas the Rust code, man, it flies um, by comparison. It's much, much faster uh, to generate the benchmarks, um, which I think is partly that the code being benchmarked is faster. Maybe it's entirely that. I don't really know. Um, actually, it probably is because uh, they're going to have to run the two systems similar numbers of times. And if the closure code is 100 times slower than the Rust code, then you would expect the closure code to take 100 times longer to benchmark. So, yeah. So we'll probably not actually run the, the closure benchmarks uh, live tonight because I think that would be pretty boring. Um, but we'll uh, get the code ready. And, um, you know, if there's time, we'll run them. But if there's not, we'll uh, call it quits and I'll do the benchmarking um, later on um, and I'll report back. Um, I'll start by reporting on the Discord channel. So there's a join link there in the QR code on the left. Um, and I can also, whoa, that was not what I meant to do. I meant to go here. Uh, um, grab the invite link. Um, copy and put that in the chat. So um, there's the, Discord invite link. So I'll start by posting any results there, and then I will hopefully remember to go over those results uh, at the beginning of the next stream a week from today. So let's actually write some closure code. Um, so let's uh, start by looking at, uh, this is the Rust system. Um, so we can construct a population. We have that implemented in Clojure. Um, and uh, what we need now is to uh, implement something that makes uh, generations happen. So th that's the part we don't have, which is really this part right here. So... Um, for the given specified number of generations. And this actually uses some nice um, command line tools generated using the clap library um, in Rust. We're not going to do anything probably that fancy here. And I'll just, pro because I want to get something done, I'll probably just hard code in the number of generations in the closure code. Um, and I can tidy that up offline if I decide that I care. Um, but for a given number of generations, we want to generate the next generation from the current generation. Um, and then when that's all done, we want to print the best, or after, after every generation, we'll print the best um, individual from that generation. So that's the piece that's missing. Um, we've got the ability to um, create a population, um, and really now it's a matter of generating the next generation from that population. Um, and if we look back at the generation par next, let's go to its definition. What do we need to do to make that happen? Um, we get the individuals out of the previous generation. So in the Rust code, um, we made a distinction between a generation and a population, um, which I think actually was a nice distinction and not something I have historically done. Um, I don't think we need to make that distinction in the closure code again, in part because I'm just trying to get this done. Um, but I think it was useful, especially in the type system, in closure to make a distinction between generations and populations. 
Um, uh, so we needed to get the individuals out of the generation. Uh, we found out how many there were, just so that we had that number. And then we made a new vector of individuals by iterating from zero to pop size, um, turning that into a parallel iterator so we could create these new individuals in parallel. Um, and then for each number, so zero, one, up to pop size minus one, we called, um, uh, oh, this, uh, sorry, this was, this was some stuff to do with um, uh, the parallel iterator, iterator and creating random number generators. And we don't really care about, oh no, sorry, I take that back. This is converting those numbers into the generation. And that was actually so that we could call the make child method, which was a thing in the generation. It's a little complicated, not really relevant to the question at hand. The main thing is we make, we call make child over and over again um, to make a new individual. And we'll do that in parallel because we're doing the par, par iter. Um, we'll collect those into a vector. That'll be the new array of individuals, uh, or vector of individuals. And then we'll make a new generation, which has got the population in it. Um, this weighted selectors, again, we don't, we'll probably just skip that and just use LexCase for the purposes of benchmarking, especially since Le LexCase was clearly much, much slower. Um, and this make child function, which will just pass around as an argument, um, or not even bother with that, perhaps. Yeah, we'll see. So, um, so we really need to write next next generation that's the main thing that we care about here um so let's do that let's write so let's actually come at this from the main perspective um so right now this benchmarks making a population let's let's remove the benchmarking for a hot second um so that we can just run stuff to see how things go um there we go. But instead of pmap make population, we're going to say run. Um, and so we'll say run GA. Uh, actually, let me back up so I have. Okay, so uh, we're going to say run GA. And we're going to need to provide a population size and a bit length and a test problem and i don't think we have to provide anything else um we will see defin run ga um pop size bit length um score uh, so this is going to do, oh, we need a number of generations. Um, so let's say, uh, we'll start with just a hundred generations, num gens. So we're going to need to, for a given number of generations, uh, generate the next generation um, and we'll want to start so we're going to want to have some initial population initial population and that's going to be uh, what did I call that um, make population but it's pmap make population uh, and pmap make population takes um, the pop size, the number of bits, and the uh, fitness function. So pop size. Um, and actually, I called it num bits there. Maybe I should call it num bits here. Num bits. 
And then what did I call the score? I called it Compute Fitness. Hmm, I kind of like score or better. I think I might keep score and actually maybe should change that elsewhere. So this takes uh, num bits, num bits, and the scorer. So that's going to be the initial population. And then we want to do a certain number of generations. And at each generation, we want to print something about the state of play. Hmm. Well, hello, Izitsu. Wonderful to see you again. Um, there's several ways to do this. Um, there's actually a very cool iterate function that calls, gives you a sequence, x, f of x, f of f of x, f of f of x. Um, and we could use that and next generation becomes the um, f of x. So we're given a population, we call next generation on it, we get the next population. Um, then we could map best across that and take the first um, num gens elements from that. And that actually would work, that would work fine. Um, and since le uh, closure is lazy, it would only generate the populations that we did something with. So that would actually not be unreasonable. Um, and in fact, do seek rather than map would probably be better because do seek would let us uh, do things about side effects, which is really what the printing is. So let's do that. We'll say that then gens is gonna be iterate, make sure I'm remembering this right. Yeah, it returns a lazy sequence of x, f of x, f of f of x. Um, so we're gonna iterate next generation and then x is the third the second argument so the initial population so that's going to generate a sequence of generations and actually we don't want an infinite sequence we'll say take num gens from that need another close print here at the end so that's the um, going to be the sequence of generations, and then we can say do seek um, gen, g is in gens, and we'll uh, print line um, stir. Uh, in so generation wah, wah, wah. uh ooh gens doesn't know what gen we're in there's a way to fix that in do seek we can get um a er, 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 oh no come on here we go closure cheat cheat uh, boom, do seek. And so actually I'm gonna make a comment here just in case somebody might know the answer. This cheat sheet, which is maintained by the closure people is totally awesome. And actually gives me a way into almost everything I care about in the basic language and I know if there is something like this for Rust, I haven't found it. I've looked around some. I did. I found there are lots of cheat sheets for Rust out there, but nothing's really like seem to sing to me in the way that this one does. Um, so you know, if you know a great cheat sheet for Rust, holler.
because I would love to know about one. So do seek. Um, there are some nifty, aren't there things like lat that I can do in here? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, here. Lat. Um, that's not really what I wanted. Uh, I want some way of counting in parallel. I thought I could do that. Uh, let's look at four. Um, oh, what is it while? No, not while. Let, when. So let gives me a local variable. When lets me test something. Um, maybe I'm just up a tree. Um, I was thinking I could do something parallel with those, but maybe what I really need to do is zip two things together. So thanks for thinking of it, though, is it, Seuss? Um, these things happen. Um, so, uh, so I think I should be able to say gen num... Oh, I guess I really want gen um, gen is going to be the result of zipping. Is it zip? Hello? Uh, zip, zip, zip. Be my friend, zip. Is it really only zip map? Oh. Oh. Um. Hmm. Interesting. I could have sworn there was a way to generate um No, I didn't start early, I don't think. I think I started at seven. Um did the clocks change in the UK? Because they haven't changed here. I think they changed next weekend. Um, when does the time change? Um, yeah, so for us in the U.S., uh, the time will change next weekend. So I'm guessing it must have happened already for you. Um, in which case, you would be... A little earlier so this actually helps you um for one week you it's not quite so late tonight so apologies for uh um you having missed half an hour it was mostly review um and then we started on the closure code with the goal of trying to be able to get to a point where we can do timing comparisons um uh between the two um, so do I care about this? How much do I care about this? Um, I could, I really thought there was a zip, but apparently there is not, which means there's got to be a simple way to do, so we could do map, um, uh, vec, Uh, range zero and gens. So that is gonna, um, why are you grumpy there? Uh, oh, it's vector. That's why you're grumpy. Um, so this is going to create an anonymous function that takes two arguments and in this case makes a vector out of them. And we're going to map this across zero dot dot and the generations. So the first element in each pair will be the generation number and the second will be uh, the population. So now we ought to be able to say gen 
num uh, and then print line stir tab best individual is going to be we have a best individual best individual and we'll pass it the gen um, actually we'll call it the pop we'll change this to be pop and that will loop over all the generations and um, it will create the generations by calling iterate with next generation. And then for each one, we'll print out the generation number and the best individual. Um, and this is unhappy because we haven't written that. So let's write that. Defin next generation. And that's going to take a population. Now, uh, hmm. Let's. I'll have a look at cheaters. Cheaters.rs. Oh, cheats.rs. Duh. Helps if I read. So I feel like I've seen this one. This is really long, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these things are sort of links down into, um, down below. So I have seen this one. I thought it looked useful, but then I never came back to it. So I don't know. I think that, I think part of what, I like about, well, but this has gotten quite long over the years as the language got bigger. But I like the structure of this um, and being able to find things. So I don't know. I'll have to, I, it suggests I should give this another shot. Um, uh, because it's, oh, and I think actually, okay, so like, um, I feel like if I tried to look up, I don't know, let's say filter. Um, okay, so I get idiomatic rust, and that's the only occurrence of filter anywhere. And that's the kind of thing, like there are so many cool things in the iterator library that, um, and I could always just have a tab open with the iterator library documentation, like it's not hard, but, um, you know, if I can't remember the name of something in Clojure, I just like go here and I almost always find it. Uh, and maybe that says something about Rust being a smaller language with large supporting libraries and Clojure being, I think, a larger language that can still have libraries and stuff, but I think is less library dependent. Um, so here, you know, filter is a piece of the language. And so it's right here in the documentation. Um, and so I think maybe that says something more about the, the differences in the way the two languages are conceived and supported. Um, and that's just the truth, right? I don't know that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's just a thing thing, but barf. Um, Okay, so we want to make a generation. So we're going to have to figure out what the pop size is. And that's going to be the length of the current population, which in closure is count. In every other language in the universe, it's like len or length. But in closure, they chose to use count as the fairly generic, this is how big a thing is. Um, so it works on maps and vectors and all kinds of different things. Um, uh, in the same way that dot len in Rust works in all the standard collection types, um, uh, but they used count. Yeah, it's a choice. 
so we know how many we need. So we basically need to iterate. So iterate um, is not what we want. We want repeat. I think it's repeat. Repeatedly. Repeatedly takes a function or a number and a function and calls that function that many times. Um, oh, but that says a function of no arguments, presumably with side effects. And we don't want side effects. But this is, yeah, this is what I want. Uh, so I think the side effects in this case will be um, the construction of the expected value. So I think repeatedly is what I want. So I want a number and a function. So I want pop size. Pop size. Ah. And I need a function that generates a child. So do I have... Uh, I'm going to need basically a make child. Make child that takes pop as an argument and is going to return the sort of a new child. So it's going to do rent, select parents at random uh, using lexicase presumably and then also do the crossover -y bits that, oh, we'll have to implement those. We don't have that in the closure code either. Okay, so I think that should give us a generation. Um, and now we have to define make child um, that's gonna take a population and uh, let's flip over to the closure and look at what make child look like. That was here. Um, so we selected two parents with um, calling get parent. I'm going to skip that and just use lexicase selection because that's really what I want to compare against. Um, I'll use the fastest version of lexicase selection. And we can play with whether we want to change that or not. Um, but I will do um, get two parents with lexicase selection. I will uh, use two point crossover, which we'll need to implement, and mutate one over length, which we need to imp implement. Then we'll score, and then we'll make an individual. Although, yeah, yeah, we'll have to make an individual. So. We'll get two parents. Um, actually, I'm just going to copy this and we'll plop it in as a big comment here, just so that we make sure we're looking at the same thing. So let first parent be lexicase. So, oh, and actually, so I was going to mention, so we did, um, after, after last week's stream, I did some looking at different ways of doing lexicase in Clojure and benchmarked those as well and um, found that I got a slight improvement. Um, so if this is the kind of standard version um, I was able to take the ideas in the Rust code and make some pretty non-idiomatic closure that was slightly faster. Um, and basically what I did was I used a pair of array lists here, which got constructed once with the... Um, with their capacity sort of set to the population size, essentially, so that we wouldn't ever have to grow those vectors 
or those array lists over time. And then this loop is basically like a, a while loop, um, uh, tail recursion loop. Um, and we don't need to sort of dwell on any of this, but the we use clear to empty the array list in the same way that we use clear to empty um, a vector in Rust, which really just move the how many things are there counter back to zero without having to um, do anything fancy. Um, I mean, anything that's already there is going to have to be garbage collected. But other than that, I mean, it's just a matter of moving the pointer back. Um, and then adding dot add is like push. So it adds um, things to the vector. Um, so we managed to never reallocate um, this winner's vector here in this loop. And then while it's not super clear here, uh, this, this matches that. So whoops, ah. So this is going to be built on the uh, memory for winners, which is being passed in as the candidate's position the next time through the loop. And the candidate's memory is being passed in in the winter's position, winner's position next time through the loop. So we only ever use those two vectors and we, or array lists, sorry. And we just swap them back and forth each time copying, well, copying pointers to the, the, the individuals that are winning on this test case, their pointers get copied over into the other array, uh, which is actually called winners. They get copied out of candidates and into winners. And then when we come back through the loop, winners becomes candidates um, that didn't work very well in this video. Winners became candidates, and then candidates is just open memory, uh, which will now be called winners that we'll copy pointers into. Um, so uh, that actually did work a little faster. Um, it wasn't a huge bit faster, and I don't know that um, it, for real closure heads, um, bringing in this array list here is probably annoying. On the other hand, optimizing uh, a piece of the code that you know is uh, problematic uh, and time consuming um, uh, seems to be you know, the right thing to do. Uh, and this is a sort of a core piece of the system that gets called many, many thousands of times. So optimizing it. If you're going to optimize something, it's the kind of thing you'd want to optimize. So I'm going to use Lex case array list. Let's see, where were we? Here we go. Lex case array list. And that takes the population and it's going to give us um, a parent, second parent, Lex case array list of pop. Now, um, we want to uh, mutate the result of crossing over the genomes. And then we're going to have to score everything. And that'll be swell. Now up here, I must have something that makes an individual. Um, now that makes it that makes a random individual. So I don't have something that makes an individual out of a array of bits. Um, so why don't we actually make that defin? Actually, can I, I don't know if this is gonna work. Uh, rename symbol, make random, individual oh it did work okay so then i think i'm going to change this to be just make no nope, make individual not make not make individual no come on 
thank you. And I'm going to have a set of bits and a compute fitness. Actually, I'm going to call it a score because I think that's a better name. Um, and that's going to just make bits are bits and fitness is score of bits. Okay. So I like that. I think that's going to be better. Um, so I can call make individual on the result of uh, oops, there, there we are. There we go. So I'm going to say make individual on. Oh, so make child's going to need to have the score passed to it. means next generation is going to have to have the score passed to it. Um, and is it partial? Doop -doop 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 -doop, I think. Partial takes a function in some of its arguments. Yes. Um, so here we know next generation is going to take the scorer and a population, but we don't we don't have the population yet. Um, so we're going to want to take this. Basically, we're going to want to say next generation with this score and a population. And partial is going to take this function and this one argument and then give us a new function that's ready for the next argument. But that requires that we put score first in there. And so probably want to make it first here just to be consistent. Um, score, bum, bum, boom. Yeah. Um, so this is what would be known as currying, currying in a lot of languages, named after Haskell Curry. And I don't think there is a simple notion of currying in Rust because of the type system. Um, but Clojure's like, sure, go crazy, do the stuff. We don't really have a type system that, well, it's a compile time type system. We'll, we'll check things at run time and you'll hope for the best. But uh, in compile time, we're not going to care. Um, so we'll pa this this will pass the score into next generation as the first argument. Um, oh, actually, is this a place where we should use threading? Ooh, no, because we have two arguments at the beginning. So I don't think threading is the right thing to do there. So make individual on mutate one over length of two point crossover. Why are we getting the dot things there? Of the first parent's genome and the second parent's genome. And that is bits of first parent and bits of second parent. And this has gotten really long, so let's make this a little tidier. Uh, uh, yeah. And then that should, I think, oh, we need to pass the score in. Um, and make individual actually takes them in the other order. So we'll fix that. Um, 
and now these two things don't exist, so they need to be implemented. So we'll select two parents. We will get the bit strings, the genomes out of those two parents. We will use two point crossover to cross them over. We'll mutate them. And then we will make a new individual that um, uses that the given score and this bit string that's created here. Cool. So then we need to implement two point crossover and mutate one over length. Um, so let's actually do that. Um, uh, so there's these two cross so crossovers here. Um, I'm, again, I'm going to just grab this and paste it in and then comment it out. So I've got it to look at as a model. Um, so two point crossover is going to take two genomes, um, first bits and second bits. Uh, those are not great names, um, but self and other don't really work. Um, and uh, do I need? To, yeah, I'll go ahead. Len will be count uh, first bits, and I'm not going to bother with the assert. I could, but I'm not going to mess with that. Um, and we don't need to worry about the cloning and we don't need to worry about the ranges um don't have to make the copies so really we just need to take two slices and join them together so we oh i guess we do need to make these two numbers don't we these are numbers. So we do need to um, uh, first ooh, cut is going to be rand uh, rand rand int takes number n gives us a number so rand int uh, len and second cut rand int len uh, now there's not a simple way to do this swap um, without making a function call and I really would rather not make a function call for this um, Well, we could use min, I guess. Um, we could say low cut is min first cut, second cut, and high cut is max first cut and second cut. No, I think that's brilliant, but it works. And then we know low cut is before high cut. And now we can append the two slices. So concat, I think, gives me, takes two sequences and joins them together. Uh, yes. Okay. So concat. Um, now, I don't think there's anything that will give me a subrange of a collection. I can use take and drop to get there, but I don't know that there's a, so there's a range, but that gives me numbers. Um, um, uh, 
it's in spec that's not really re relevant um, sub seek no that's a more of a filtery thing uh, yeah I think we're just going to be stuck with take and drop oh well that's annoying but we don't have slices and we don't have slice for search or oh no that's an example of an abstraction yeah we don't have slices um, so we're just gonna have to muddle through so we want to take um, from zero to first zero to low so take low from first bits and then we want from low to high from the second bits so that means we need to take minus high cut low cut we want to take that many from the result of dropping low cut from second bits and then we want to drop high cut from first bits and that gives us oh it's low cut and it's dash not underscore and there we go so we're taking the first low cut bits from first and everything but the first high cut bits from first and the bit in between we're taking from second so we're dropping low cut bits from second. So we're losing that first section. And then we're taking this many high minus low from that. And in theory, that all ought to do the right thing. And um, yeah. So there's low of these, there's high minus low of those, and there's length minus high of those. And so those cancel and those cancel and we have length left. So that should have the right length and it should be good. Okay, that was weird, but there we are. And then we want, um, uh, mutation one over length which also is borrowing is calling that um, so we'll do that up here you know comment all you out and deafen mutate one over length and that's going to take just a sequence of bits. Um, and we're going to let um, len be count bits. And we'll say mutation rate is going to be 1.0 divided by len yeah that's right and then we can just map 
a function over the bits here. Um, so map blah blah over bits. And what's that function? That function is going to take a uh, it's going to generate a random value and if the random value is less than the mutation rate so we're going to say if less than rand random because random returns something between 0 and 1 right um, no, nope. hey, hang on. Uh, rand. Oh, it's just rand, not random. And it returns something to zero and one. Okay. So rand. If rand is less than the mutation rate, then we want to. Uh, flip the bit and we don't have a good way well I guess we'd say minus one bit otherwise we do bit and we're going to map that across all the bits oh and the bit is percent because that's what we're mapping this anonymous function across. So minus one percent, if percent is zero, we'll get one back. If it's one, we'll get zero back. So that effectively flips that bit. Um, uh, which is useful. Um, so that does that. Oh, I did this with underscores. Mutate one over length. That's why that was red. Okay. Zippity doo dah. Now, are we, do we, have we implemented all of the things? I think we did, really? So we might be able to run it. That'd be weird. And it's um, pretty early. It's only a little after eight. Uh, this is, oh, whoa, that's not good. Uh, we didn't pr print anything. Um, so run GA. Well, that's weird. So I'm guessing this is something to do with lazy evaluation. That um, in closure, if you don't use it, if you don't have something that uses something, it just doesn't bother making it. Um, so it's possible that this... So do seek I wonder if for some reason Let's just print
print that just to make sure that we are making a population. Yes, we are. And it has fitnesses and things. And that all seems good. Um, This is going to print a huge amount of stuff, uh, I think, uh, unless it's the source of the problem. Um, yeah. Although, is that? Wah, wah, wah. Is there a generation, or was that actually all just one generation? Well, here, let's um, grab, I did say generation, right? Oh, it only printed that once. Okay. So it did do that. Okay. That's, I was someone thinking I was going to get that every time, but that was not true. Um, so it did do those things. Then the do seek did not do what I thought it was going to do. Now range zero. Oh, if you, it's, it gives you the end initially. And if you don't give it anything, it goes from zero to... So that was my problem. I, this range zero was giving me a list of zero elements. And so when I mapped them, map... The length of the result of map is the length of the shorter... The shortest of all the arguments. And since this was empty, the result of the map was empty. So this was never happening. So I think that will fix that problem. Let's comment all of this out so we don't get a huge amount of printing that we don't want. We'll still get a lot of printing we don't want, but it'll be, there we go. Okay. And now that was, how long did that take? With the printing, that was eight seconds. And that was a um, hundred individuals and a hundred generations. If I make that a thousand individuals and 50 generations, then we'll be more comparable with, um, oh, and it's a lot slower. Um, the rust code, although we are not using all of my cores, uh, which makes me think we're not doing this in parallel. Um, but we did PMAP. Oh, but next generation doesn't do anything in parallel. Um, my use of repeatedly here, that's actually serial, not parallel. Uh-huh. So to make this comparable, we need to change this to do parallel stuff, not serial stuff. So my use of repeatedly not gonna win. So PMAP, so actually we basically want PMAP make, make child score pop cross range pop size.
So that's gonna make a child for every element of this range. It's gonna call this function, which ignores its argument, but we don't care. And it'll do that in parallel. And so now this should spin up all my cores. Might mess up the stream a little. Um, fingers crossed that won't be an issue. Oh, uh, no, stop it. Didn't mean to click on that. Ah. Um, uh, so apologies if uh, the stream gets a little wacky here for a second. Um, but hopefully this will not eat the whole world. Whoa. And we blew up the world. Wrong number of arguments. Passed to next generation. <laughs> So we passed one argument to next generation when it was expecting more than that. And that was on line 125, maybe. I'm not sure I trust that. Um, no, probably not. So it was next generation, where we call next generation. <coughs> takes two arguments only appears in these two places what are you talking about computer um, oh hmm this FN867 this is probably a, an anonymous function um, I don't know if that's this thing. It's probably this thing. And this is what we changed. So this is not doing the right thing. Let's change this to an FN. function and collection and this is going to give me a collection we're not going to care about the argument try that <laughs> yeah so the the hash thing didn't do the right thing um, sometimes hash gets a little confused um, and I'm not sure why it was confused there to be honest with you but it didn't like it and this is spinning up all the cores, so if you can't hear me, that'll be why. All the fans are going. You might be able to hear that. So that took 23 and a half seconds, whereas before... Oh, and I was going to make this 50 generations, and I didn't. Oh, I did. Um, really? Hello? <laughs> okay, 49. So let's be a little more careful about scrolling here. Apologies for the dizzying scroll action. Um... Okay, so it was 50 seconds, 51 seconds without parallelism. It was 23, 24 seconds with parallelism. Which is less than I would have expected, to be honest with you. Um, I would have thought that we would have gotten a higher rate of return on parallelizing. This box has got eight, four cores, eight threads. Um, so I certainly would have expected more than um, a factor of two. Um, so we can't serialize making the general, or can, we can't parallelize making the generations because you have to have one generation before you can make the next. Um, so really, 
it's within a generation that you can parallelize and we're doing that right here so we're making children in parallel and i don't know that's interesting because i think the um rust let's see if we come back over here um so rust is set up so we ought to just be able to run it cargo run minus minus so if we try to make things similar so we can make parallel for 50 generations and population size a thousand and bit like down or 28 and the target problem hif i think that's what we were doing here yeah a thousand individuals 128 50 generations um and that should be running essentially the same problem oh we got to compile because i haven't run this in a while actually i'm not quite sure what we're compiling but we're compiling and Oh, and we need to supply a selection mechanism. Um, and that must be, oops. Uh, I think I added that as a selector in args. Um, but I must not have provided, but I thought I provided a default, yeah. Um, boop, boop, boop. so this is the panic that we got oh yeah so I, I guess I do have to su supply something well then um uh cargo run minus 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 help i think we'll list everything um uh, so minus minus alexa case selection and i want to do reuse vector because that was the fastest of those um and oh that doesn't print anything anymore i think i took the printing out to speed things up let's uh put the printing back um you know let's just bring that guy back and now i'll have to recompile that So that actually looks pretty comparable. Uh, if anything, slower. Wow. And I'm eating all my cores that may be killing the stream. I hope not. Derp. I'm going to kill that. Uh, so apologies if that was destroying the stream. So that actually seemed a lot slower than the closure. Uh, which surprises and confuses me. Um, do I actually have... So we're doing 50 generations, 1,000 individuals... 128 bits and hif and that's a thousand individuals 128 bits 50 generations hif hmm hmm 
That's really interesting. Because this is like a lot slower. Oh, maybe. Yeah. So that's like minus minus release here. No. Uh, oh, it goes after run. Okay. Try that. Oh, it's going to recompile, isn't it? Oh, and I think that the timing library criterion or criterion, whichever one it is, one of them is criteria between closure and rust. One of them is criterion and one of them is criterium. And I can never remember which. Okay, that did go a whole lot faster. But still, not a lot faster than closure. That is super interesting. Now, there is a lot of randomness here. And so it's possible that um, the randomness is part of the difference in performance. Um, that was only 11 seconds. So that's perhaps concerning that the differences vary so much, which is why we'll have to do it. I'll have to do like proper testing. So that's 11 seconds twice. And here, um, go little computer. Um, Now, something's amiss, though. So both the two closure runs I did, the best fitness on HIF was in the 200s. I think they were both pretty close to the... Oh, no, 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 no. That's right. I do actually... So there's a little difference. In... The Rust code, I um, no, I don't. I was thinking that I guaranteed that the best individual got carried forward, but that's not true. Actually, this is doing everything with lexicase selection. So they're the same in that regard. Um, hmm. We are printing the best individual is what we expected. Hmm, something's different. The other thing that's interesting is the closure code runs at about the same speed all the way through. The Rust code is really fast and then slows down and runs at a pretty steady rate without any improvement, like w once it stops getting better, then the speed breaks. And so we've reached like a stable state. Nothing seems to improve after this. And the performance doesn't get better. Whereas when we run it in closure, we get the same pace all the way through and we don't get this improvement. 
So this, and this doesn't look like a very good problem for HIF, which suggests that I got either the crossover or the mutation wrong. I wonder, um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of like stuck here in the 200s. We, we're about where we start. We never seem to get better. So my lexicase is broken or, oh, 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 I wonder if, does my lexicase accidentally return the, the small value instead of the big value? Um, if this error is less than best error, that's the bad thing. Because these aren't errors anymore. I copied this over from some timing studies that I were doing. And these really aren't errors. These are scores. And you want the scores to be higher. Um, let's try um, renaming some things. So we want, if this score is better than best score, and if this score is equal to best score. So that's why it was never getting better. And that probably also meant it was never converging to a single bit string, lots of copies of one bit string, which at which point lexicase is gonna get a lot slower because we're not um, removing duplicates. Um, so I think this might be the reason for the difference. Let's find out if this made it better. Did not seem to have helped any. Curses. Oh, oh, did I did I fix the right one? Because there are at least two lex cases in here. Yeah, but this is the one we're using. Lex case array list. I probably should fix this one also. So we want max score for K supply max. Um, ooh, can't spell score for K. Um, but we're not actually calling that and it's even telling us we're never using it. Um, I don't think there's any place else where that's happening. Um, oh, 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 Hif. Hif returns a number. That's the problem. Ugh. And that's why closure is so much faster. Ho oh, ho. Yes. So I forgot, and this happened weeks ago in the Rust code, but both HIF and count ones were initially functions that just returned a single numeric score. How many of the bits were ones? What was the total HIF? score. But to use lexicase, we modified those to um, be uh, functions that took, let's see, I think that's in here, if, yeah, functions that um, instead returned vectors of numbers and use those vectors to decide on uh, to lex case would use those vectors to to do the selection, and I didn't change that in the closure code. So, and this is where a type system would have totally like stopped me from making this mistake. If here just returns a number, as does count ones. 
And so when we use it, fitness is going to be a single number. And then lexicase, how does lexicase even? Oh, it calls errors um, instead of fitness. Errors is going to be a null. And so this map is going to generate a null. And then max does whatever max does on an empty list. So all of this was just complete nonsense. Um, I don't know what Lexcase was doing, but I'm guessing it was basically making random selections. And so that's why the closure code never got better. Lexcase was very fast because it didn't have to iterate over lots of scores because there were zero scores. And that's why closure looks so quick. Oof. Man, I thought I was losing my mind. So let's, um, it's 8.40, 8.36. Let's actually fix count ones and leave hif out for the moment. Um, uh, to do fix hif so it returns a list of scores. And we can make this easy for count ones because it's just bits. Um, so um, this literally will just be bits. I'll comment that out so we have that. And so we'll run the test with bits instead of if, and we need to make. So we really want this to be scores and this to be scores. Yeah, a type system really would have been useful here. Um, so this is going to be scores and scores. And this is going to be scores and scores and scores. Okay, now, and if I change this to be count ones, fingers crossed, we will actually see it make progress. Whoa, or it'll die. Uh, so we got a null pointer exception. Where? Um, presumably, I got, I tried getting scores out of something. Um, oh, this name's terrible because that's, uh, really, that should be scores. And this should be compute scores. Uh, or scorer, since that's what I was using. Now, Is there some place I'm using error? Oh, right there. Well, that's not the one. That's not the Lex case I'm actually using. So there's no place I'm using errors anymore. Hmm. <laughs> And I did say that, right? Yes. So that will die in the same place. Uh, um, oh, colon fitness. Yes, good catch. Bingo. Right there. 
Oh. Oh, and we really want... Whoa, stone to go away. I forgot. We really want both scores and total... So we could say fitness. It's not a great name, but we could say sum. Sum, sum doesn't exist. So uh, reduce uh, plus zero collection plus zero scores. Uh, and then we'll want to do the same thing here. Fitness reduce plus zero scores. Oh, I don't have scores, so I'm going to need to let scores be scorer bits. And that you guys and give myself another close here. And then this is going to be scores. So I don't compute that twice because that wouldn't be fair. And now let's look for fitness. So that makes sense. We want to use the best, the max key there. We want the max, yes, because we want the largest value of the score. Okay, let's try that. Good, good catch, Zitsu. Thank you. Because that definitely needed to be changed. Hey, we went through a generation. Um, no. Oh, look at that. Look that is. Oh, yeah. That's more what I was looking at. Okay. We don't. Month. Let's kill that and let's change this. And I could do command line stuff and I really should, but I'm just trying to get something quick. Let's change this to 100 individuals so there's some chance that we'll see this finish. And let's actually even just take it down to 10 generations um, so that it finishes in this lifetime. Um, Okay, that was much faster. And we saw the fitness definitely go up. So initially, it was 79, 85, up to 96. That was also pretty fast. So we could probably do something more like 50 generations and get something that won't be too terribly slow. <laughs> Getting close to the best possible twenty would be even. And we just need six generations. So maybe we should have done some more lucky generations because it's going to be really slow at that point. So let's go to thirty. So we get a time in this lifetime. Um. <laughs> So the stream lagged or misbehaved um, once it started to do something. Um, apologies. It's like, I really ought to have, and I could do this for this kind of stuff. I could be logged in remotely on a computer in the lab. Uh, and then we would be spinning up that CPU when I do stuff like this instead of spinning up the same CPU that's driving the stream. Um, and that would probably yield a better performance. Um, okay, so let's see. Now we want to do this, but we want count ones. And we want 30 gener 100 individuals and 30 generations for comparison. Boom. Whoa. 
that didn't even blip. Like I've got a, you know, CPU back thing, actually B top running in a window that you can't see. And that did all 30 generations so quickly that it didn't even, well, here I can move the thing over and show you what I mean. So this blurb here, that is the closure run. And this section here has, I think this little tiny hiccup here is the uh, rust run. And this widening here is because I moved BTOP over, which means I'm giving um, uh, the streaming software a little more something to work with. So this says we did 100 individuals for 30 generations in 740 milliseconds versus 12 seconds. So that is uh, 10, not quite 20. So, um, uh, divided by 741, so 16 times faster. That's interesting. So it's significantly faster, but it's not, um, like changing the world faster. Well, I mean, actually 24 times is pretty changing the world. Also, I'm not sure how much of this time on the rust side was spent doing the IO um, because it was so fast that that IO could have actually been a significant chunk of the time. I wonder if we dump it to dev null. Yeah, so that dropped it from 700 and something to 500 and something. Be consistent. Oh, 300? 300, 300, 300. So without the I.O., we're at 300 and something. Um, and uh, so now that's a factor of 40. Yeah, I think that's an improvement of about 40. And that's a lot. Now, I'm not dumping the I.O. here, um, but I don't think we'll try it. I don't think it'll make as much difference because proportionally... I mean, here we dropped uh, 200 milliseconds. Well, you dropped 200 milliseconds off of 12 seconds. Who's going to much care? Oh, it even went slower, but that could just be the randomness. Um, oh, and I'm now probably destroying the stream. Um, yeah. So that's, I think, not going to make much difference um, proportionally uh, on the closure side. Um, but the rust is so fast that the IO actually matters. Um, and so when I do, I'll do proper um, benchmarking with criterion and criterium, respectively. Um, out after the stream's over, I'll run some benchmarks and, and I won't have the streaming software running. And so it'll be a little more, um, straightforward. Um, I'll also bump up the, I'll, I'll switch back to HIF. Oh, that means I'll have to implement a more correct version of HIF enclosure, but that's okay. I'll switch back to HIF and I will, um, uh, bump the population size up um, because I, again, I think memory management is a significant part of the problem in closure land. And that's going to be in some ways proportional to the population size. So I think having the larger population is more interesting. And I'll do the test. I'll post the results on um, Discord. Uh, again, uh, link to the Discord. Um, hi, Kitty Sushi six four three four three. It's going well. Actually, I think we just got a very nice result um, after having been kind of in a panic that the result was all on its head a little earlier. Um, 
but uh, so I'll I'll post the results. Um, <laughs> thank you, because that'll be easier than trying to do the whole thing. Um, I'll post the results on the Discord. Oh, let me uh, share the Discord link again because it's always useful. Um, and it's in the QR code, but there's a Discord link. Um, so I'll finish implementing the proper version of um, HIF enclosure. I'll run the... Um, uh, the benchmarks and I'll post the results in discord and then this should be here. I'll, I'll try to remember to review them at the beginning of next Wednesday's stream as well. Um, so where, um, uh, yeah, I should update it in the about me. Um, it's, it's, it's the seven day, um, expiration. There's nothing between seven day and seven days in infinity. And um, I've never sort of tried to manage a public discord like this. Um, so I was kind of cowardly to be brutally honest uh, and have been sticking with um, uh, seven day things and then just updating them. But I totally forgot to uh, update it in the about me. I should do that. So thank you for the pointer. Um, and maybe I should just not be a coward. Um, it's not like people have been flooding in. Um, uh, there aren't that many people and it's not, you know, I mean, uh, there's been some good conversations, but it's not like super busy or anything. Um, so, uh, hopefully uh, there'll be stuff on the discord and I'll go over stuff at the stream next Wednesday and I guess it's worth pointing out, because I hadn't thought about it until the Zitsu missed the beginning of the stream, we are in the season of time changes, and in the U.S., the time change will happen this weekend. Um, uh, yeah, this is one of these places where I, I, I'm not a experienced Discord person. Um, I've used it some. I've never managed one before. So, um, like, things like that. I'm not super on top of it. Um, oh, so it's, yeah. So Sunday morning this week and we lose an hour in the U S. Um, uh, apparently it's already happened. Oh, thanks for the follow. Um, apparently it's already happened in the UK. I don't know where it's happening in the rest of Europe or in Asia, um, in Africa, South America. I, mean, I have no idea, but in the U.S., it's happening this weekend. So if that has an impact on your local time, there we go. Um, but I'll remind everybody that, so Saturday, and that'll be before the change, there'll be 10 to noon on the Ice Repos project, um, which is a web app with... Um, uh, Rust and the U framework, um, but we're currently, I'm flailing horribly, but I'm doing some homework and hopefully I'll be a little more on top of it on Saturday. Um, we're using Rust to make a Cloudflare worker that provides the server side of the app because we got the client side mostly kind of in a place and we now need to have some server infrastructure in place to be able to do OAuth. Um, and to interact with GitHub um, with tokens and stuff. So hopefully that will be happening Saturday morning and I'll be a little less confused than I was yesterday. And then Saturday uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. we'll be working on system lab stuff, in particular the segmented file system client in Rust. Um, and that's um, sort of implementing a lab that we use in our systems lab course in Rust, whereas historically it's typically, the students have always implemented it in Java. And I wanna see kind of what it looks like in Rust. And I think 
that Saturday morning we'll probably finish it. I think we're pretty close to done. Pretty much all we have left to do now is assemble the packets and write them to the file system, which might actually take under an hour. Um, so I better have something else to do after that. Not sure what that's going to look like. Might come back to one of these things. Um, the evolution of computation or ICE repos. Um, uh, or might have a different systems lab to look at. And then, so those will be before the time change. And the next week, Tuesday, 10 to noon, uh, more ICE repos. And Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m., more evolutionary computation. Computation. Um, probably moving back to Rust. Um, I think we've got the basic genetic algorithm stuff happening. So we'll switch to implementing uh, a system. We'll, I'm going to see if we can do it by extending the existing system as opposed to starting a new system. But uh, building a system that does genetic programming. So we're actually evolving computer programs instead of evolving strings of bits. Um, and there are a, several ways that that's done. I'm probably going to use a thing called push GP, push GP. If you want to Google that between now and next week. Um, and, uh, we'll try to implement a push GP system in Rust. And I think there's going to be some weirdness there. I think, I'm not sure how the type system is going to interact with, um, these general instructions that we need to be able to handle. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what that'll look like, but that's why we have the stream. So thank you all very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you again, Zitsu, for all of your feedback and suggestions and Kitty for the good ideas uh, and the follow. We do appreciate it. Um, I will hopefully see some of you on Saturday um, and some of you again next Wednesday when we come back to this. So thank you all. We will talk to you later. Bye.